Now, hello and welcome to part two of four. So, and one thing I do want to make clear is I know I'm being lazy over the Christmas period in that I am doing topics which can be both lives and long patrols, so I am doing them as both. But longer term, there will be occasionally some lives which will also be long patrols, and some long patrols which will also be lives, depending on the order I decide to do the two in. But, as a rule, there are going to be some topics which are better off live, i.e. done seminar style, and some which are done better done, long patrol, or lecture style. Well, that's how I think of them anyway. So, um, right then, on we go. Now, the Naval Defence Act of 1889, like everything in British political life, did not happen in a vacuum and did not happen without debate. There's quite a lot of political discussion because this was quite a big break from the tradition. I actually rather like the Naval Defence Act of 1889, even though it is quickly overtaken in many regards by events, and let's be honest, Fifteen years later, they're building the Dreadnought. Thirty years later, aircraft carriers are a fixture in fleets. Forty-five years later, you're dealing with a fairly hefty changeover in the role of destroyers and submarines. 60 years later, you have got very different navies than you had in 1889. But that doesn't really matter. And I do apologise if I'm fiddling for my hair, but it's very long and I haven't managed to get... Uh, I, because I'm in tier 4, I can't go to someone else to get it cut, to a hairdresser or, or barber to get it cut. And I do use both, because I have a godmother who's a hairdresser. So, I have to have a good reason not to use god... Uh, not to use my godmother. She's very old school and does prefer hairdresser as any title. Anyway, that's all off to one side. Well, to an extent it isn't. Because actually, that's quite a good model to talk about. Okay. So. Royal Navy had traditionally done its ships in peacetime, especially itself in its own royal dockyards. The interesting thing about in the innovative thing of the Naval Defence Act would be its ordering of stuff from from uh, 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 commercial dockyards. Now why does this matter? Because it's the Royal Navy building up capacity. It's Britain building up capacity. For example, let's take hairdressing. If everyone did their own hair themselves, decided to just buy those razor units I keep looking at online, and just did that with your hair and everyone looked the same, then there wouldn't be a call for hairstyling. Hairstylists for hairdressers. Everyone be self-sufficient. Lovely, you might think. But then let's say they get to demand. 
There's a bit of competition. People want to look professional. They want to look neater. So a couple of people get involved and start doing other people's hair. So instead of you having to do it yourself, you get someone else doing so. And then it grows and someone starts charging for this because they're doing it not just for their family, for mates' rates, they are doing it as a profession. This slowly grows the capacity and eventually more and more people get involved and you have more and more capability and eventually you have it like today where you have a hairstylist or barbers or sometimes both on pretty much every street, sometimes multiple of them. And you suddenly have this massive capacity and so you have no real excuse other than COVID and the tier system not to have clean, tidy, well groomed hair that doesn't look like you're turning mildly I don't know into a hairy monster um I'm used to having my hair short let's just leave it at that it's self-conscious so it builds capacity therefore this act has to be judged on about four different levels. It cannot be judged just as what ships does it provide. Because ship types can be ships and ship types and ship technologies can be overtaken by events very quickly, as already mentioned. It cannot be judged on how cost effective it was. Just how cost effective it was. That's got to be part of this judging, but. To be honest, that's a really a small part. It also has to be judged on how effectively does it make a diplomatic statement and what statement does it make. But finally, it has to be judged on its capacity building. I.e., does it lay the framework for what comes next? Because, think about this. In World War II, we talk about the massive American shipbuilding effort. The massive Canadian shipbuilding effort. And the massive, there was a large British one, but it's far, it needs the others as well. In World War I, we don't talk about that as much. In World War I, there is a large number of shipyards in the UK capable of doing the work. The war is different. And, honestly, there's no strategic bombing going on of the, of the shipyard, so that does make things easier. But, well, there is. There are the, the, the lovely airships and a few of the um, gophers, but, you know. Compared to World War II, it's... And the reason for that is the capacity had, thanks to a combination of a mercantile boom, i.e. a boom in merchant ship production, and the warship production started off with this act, had meant that shipbuilding had had a pretty consistent growth for 25 years. 25 years. Which was great. It meant when World War went through World War One, great. But then you have World War II the interwar period, and then you have World War II. And that's the problem, really, is when World War II happens, and the impact of the recession, and some of the spending decisions made by governments during the interwar years, as well as the treaties, and their rules on replacement of ships. Because, of course, one of the tricks the Royal Navy and the Admiralty and the government had consistently used previously in peacetime was to just keep replacing old ships and sell them off to other people. It's 
kind of like what the British government's probably proposing to do with the Type 31s and Type 32s. Keep churning them out and just sell off old ones to keep the shipyards going. It makes sense. Won't get into it, but in the interwar period, if they made more use of the sloop clause, that would have been helpful. So, here are your architects, because Britain does have a foreign policy in this period. And we have two gentlemen who have very neatly kept hair. <laughs> I will stop making hair comments. I will, I promise. But anyway, a very nice beard on the third Marquess of Salisbury. Robert Gascoigne Cecil. He is the Prime Minister, de facto Foreign Minister, and is the architect in many ways of all this. And Granville George Loveson Goer, who is former Foreign Minister and in many ways leader of the opposition on this topic. Although not officially leader of opposition, he just leads the opposition to this. You have to understand two things. Whilst I would call neither of these men isolationist, they are Britain apart. Whether considering an, a multilateral, mm, informal, but not formalised alliance strategy, or a more formal alliance strategy, whether they're supporting the build-up of a large navy, or they are in one case, is wanting to still build up a large navy, but wanting to do it without so much order or decision, or the, it, without having quite such a, tra a break from practice. They are not do too dissimilar. In fact, in many ways, you would get a far more articulate debate going on because of their similarities. So one of the interesting things you notice about late 19th century, early 20th century politics in the UK, the first past the post system really did work to weed out the extremes and bring in the, broadly speaking, the uh, centre political spectrum of the spectrum political spectrum and there are exceptions to this but I'm talking broader strokes and they don't start going down the route of catchy slogans or trying to sloganize their perspective perhaps because of the media difference perhaps you know because of the the difference in time and the tone and the way things were disseminated in information wise. But rather, they argue in the nuance, and this is most clearly seen in this debate. The nuance is what they are focusing on. And it is, it's always a pleasure to read. And there'll be a link below to the Hansard debate to go. Please do go and read the Hansard debate of this. <laughs> and the record of it in Parliament, please go and read it. It is a gorgeous debate to read. I mean, literally, you read it and you may not agree with some of the sentiments and some of the views expressed. They are certainly not in touch with our time in many of their, way, in, in their ways. But, and you should never judge the people of the past by the, Technically, uh, by the ethics, mm, perhaps not the ethics, but and by the standards in terms of the full moral picture of today, of the day you're at present, you know, it'll always be found wanting. But they are the debate. It's quality, and it makes you think. What has happened to our politics? Why do we not get this standard of? elocution of incisive debate versus petty point scoring which seems to be quite a lot of politics is for
all sides of the spectrum on that one. Right. This is an extract, as said, from the Marcus of Salisbury's instruction. My lords, I have now to move to the second reading of the Naval Defence Bill. The bill has been before the public for some time, and I imagine that its provisions and the purposes with which it has been brought forward are familiar to your lordships. Still, I think it would not be respectful if I did not indicate what is the nature of the, the provisions, in some respects unusual, and I think important, which we have presented to Parliament, and what are the considerations which have induced us to submit them. It is proposed to apply the sum of 21 and a half millions to the strengthening of the Navy. 10 millions of it will be applied to ships to be built by contract by private builders. 11 and a half millions will be applied to ships to be built in Her Majesty's dockyards, and they will be built within four and a half years. Of the sum, we take it that three quarters is for hulls and machinery, and one quarter for armament. It has been said that it is a mistake to represent this sum of 21 and a half millions as being an entirely an extraordinary effort to provide for the naval defence of our trade and of the kingdom, because although 10 millions which are to be paid to contractors will undoubtedly uh, and will be undoubtedly an extraordinary expense, the rest will be borne on the ordinary estimates of the year and may be spoken of as ordinary expenditure. That, however, my lords, is a fallacy. The 11.5 millions which will be expended in Her Majesty's dockyards will be borne on the naval estimates of the year, but is very much in excess of that which can be called ordinary expenditure. Of course, the term ordinary expenditure is a very vague one, because the meaning entirely depends on the, the period of time that you select as your normal point, as the datum point from which the expenditure is to be measured. I do not wish to discuss what has been done by noble lords opposite, but if I may, may take Lord Be Beaconsfield's administration as a period of normal naval estimates, the case would end uh, stand thus. In the four years ending in 1879, our expenditure on the new naval construction was two millions a year. In the four years which ended with the present year, a portion of which is no doubt due to arrangements on my noble friend above the gangway, our naval expenditure on new construction has been 3,100,000. In the four years that will end in 1893, the naval expenditure on the estimates for new construction will be 4,200,000. So that taking Lord Beaconsfield's administration as the normal expenditure by which to measure the estimates, there is an excess for each year of four or five times that are, are coming of the 2,200,000 very nearly making up the 11.5 millions which, as I have said, we intend to spend in Her Majesty's dockyards. Some nobles, lords present, will of course think that we ought not to have spent so much. I am not entering that into the merits or demerits of expenditure now, but merely putting the matter upon its proper footing, namely that it is an extra expenditure of 11.5 millions upon the Navy. The present Board of Admiralty have, been have made considerable changes in the traditional practice with respect to the allocation of expenditure. It was the old practice of all Boards of Admiralty to begin a great deal more work than they had any chance of finishing in a short time, and to go on with a great many jobs in hand and to take considerable time in finishing each job. The policy of the present Board of Admiralty has been to finish every bit of work as fast as they could before beginning any new work. The importance of that arrangement is that they are able to foresee with much more accuracy what their expenditure at all times will be, and to keep up a regular rate of expenditure. That means a regular rate of labour, and so to employ the same number of men without a sudden changes in the way of reduction or increase the, the establishment. But the habit of doing a good many things at one time and not finishing them has been largely produced by certain treasury arrangements, arrangements which I have no doubt were originally very valuable to the finishing and finance of the country, but which have not had a had an advantageous effect upon the shipbuilding of the navy. The treasury arrangement is to estimate how much of a ship will be built in a particular year, and if a less sum was then spent on it, the money had to be returned to the treasury. If more, a ship or a supplementary estimate had to be asked for.
The result has been there has been an artificial adaptation of the structure of the ship in order to suit the financial exigencies of, of the calculations that we made. So that if possible, there should be spent on the ships so much in the final financial year as was intended and no more. Wow. You see, Britain had a long period of naval terms, peace, pretty much by 1889. There hadn't been many conflicts, and those have been small, short ones that hadn't required a large fleet mobilization, really, or, you know, there'd been the Crimea and places like that, but, and these things had been, had had a large fleet for them, but it wasn't battles at sea were going to have to put a test our naval technology against someone else's naval technology it was more a we're sending a whole load of ships and they're going to basically be floating shore bombardment which allowed in many ways the old ways that worked during the Napoleonic period to work carry on You can see this act is about putting that funding onto much more of what we would consider a modern standard. I.e. the idea of a ship being held up in its construction because if they spend too much money that year, they have to ask for some extra money from somewhere. And if they spend too little, they lose it would seem quite absurd. Although that is actually the system which I do believe the Treasury has been running the British um, department, uh, departmental spending for other departments for if not for a few years, a few possible decades. In that, if a department spends all its money, it, does, it has to ask for more. But if it spends less than its money, it has to return it to the government uh, to the Treasury and can't allocate it to other areas within its remit that require money. <laughs> Problematic. Salisbury goes on, though. He always goes on. The necessary consequence has been that the arrangements have been artificial, and from time to time it has been necessary, sometimes to discharge men because they had not enough money, and other times to take on more men because they had more money than the existing establishment could get through in their financial year. In this matter, we have most undoubtedly made a new departure. We have abandoned the practice of calculating the building of ships by bits. Besides the inconvenience it has caused, I think it has had a bad effect in relation to political influences. Uh, when the year comes round again, the plans for building ships come under consideration, perhaps before a new First Lord of Amity, perhaps before a new Chancellor of the Exchequer, and under changed conditions, under circumstances where there might, when there might be a desire to save money, or possibly there might be a panic, and the result has been a stretching and a contracting, as it were, of the plan of a ship, with a perpetual liability to all toleration, which has produced some of the strange anomalies that have been brought before our attention in recent discussions. We desire when a ship is once begun on a given plan that she shall be pushed through as fast as the establishment at our command will enable us. With regularity, without unnecessary intermission, and without any alterations, either financial or otherwise. Therefore, the ships to be provided by the money that is now to be placed by Parliament at the disposal of the government will be begun and carried through within a given time and without further reference to Parliament. And without an act of Parliament, it will not be in the power of a future First Lord or Chancellor of the Exchequer to alter the plan now adopted. The next point I have to show your Lordships is that the, what addition to the Navy this expenditure will produce. It is on the whole 70 ships. 30 of which, 8 of which will be built in Her Majesty's dockyards, and 32 by contract. Those ships are thus distributed. Of dockyard ships, 14 will be battleships, 20 will be protected cruisers, and 4 will be smaller ships. Of the contract vessels, 4 will be battleships, 22 protected cruisers, and 6 will be smaller ships. Taking into account the ships we, will, uh, we build this year, we should be in 1894 stronger than we are now by 113 ships. That increase is a specific, especially directed uh, 
towards the increase of our cruisers, in which we found there was a deficiency. Whereas we increased our battleships from 50 to 65, we increase our protected and armor cruisers from 40 to 100. Most interesting point, however, is what is the regulation, a relation of the fleet we hope to have in 1894 to the fleets of other powers? It has been laid down as a sort of general rule or maximum for the guidance of this country, nah, as a great maritime nation, that we ought always to have at our commands a fleet which would be equal to a combination of any two great powers which might be brought against us. I think on the whole, this ideal state will have been reached in 1894. In that year, the armoured battleships of England will be 77, those of France 48, of Germany 40, of Russia 27, and of Italy 19. If Germany and France were to unite against us, I do not think the combination is a probable one, they could bring only 88 armoured ships against our 77. If your lordships examine the details of the ships, you will find a considerable number both in Germany and France put down as armoured battleships, which are really very small vessels, only armed for coastal defence. But in any other combination, such as that of France and Russia, France and Italy, Germany and Italy, or Russia and Italy, in all these cases, our armoured battleships will be more numerous than the armoured battleships of any other two powers combined. In respect to protected cruisers, we shall be still stronger. There is a technical distinction between protected and armoured ships. In the former, the protection is applied only to the vital parts of the ships. The protected cruisers of England will be in 1894 be 88, those of France 14, Germany 10, Italy 17, and Russia 3, making a total of 44. So England will have precisely twice as many as the other four powers altogether. That, my lords, so far as numbers go, appears to me, as far as we can make any calculation indicate, a satisfactory state of uh, things. I am aware that there are naval critics who will not be satisfied with this provision, and who think that we have fallen short in our efforts to provide for defence of the country. I have seen such views maintained by distinguished men in published articles. He goes on to discuss those distinguished men in published articles, and is far more polite than possibly uh, many of us would have been in a similar situation. After all, he's providing for a fleet which is twice the strength in cruisers, of the next four largest powers combined, and he's being told that's still not enough. <clears throat> How much of my budget do you want me to spend on ships? I'd love to have that equivalent budget to spend on ships. I'd be in clover. But what you realize is this is an economic warfare decision. The other thing that's interesting is it's focusing on armoured cruisers. I'm going to be getting into this topic later, but let's see. Battleships, there is a much uh, there is a growth going on, and we will discuss that when we're looking at them. But armoured cruisers and cruisers, they are the ships which are staying the most consistent. Yes, they're growing in capabilities and all these things, but to be fair, your cruisers are more likely to be still frontline capable cruisers rather than becoming second, maybe even third rate, like the battleships. Potentially, within a few years, whereas the cruisers could survive a couple of decades and still be capable of frontline service. So, Cruisers are a good investment, and they are the overwhelming focus of this construction. There are 18 battleships out of the 70 ships. The remainder are protected cruisers or other cruisers, or forms of cruisers. In fact, 42. So, 18 battleships, 42 protected cruisers, 10 others. That's quite some focus. 
But what does the opposition have to say? Here is the Earl Granville. I do not consider it necessary for me to follow the noble Marquess into the details, which I am bound to say he has very clearly explained to the House. But I should be unwilling to allow this bill to pass without saying a few words. I do not oppose it, but I do not think it is a bill which should pass this House in silence. The bill comes to this House backed with the approval of a large majority of the House of Commons, which is the special guardian of the public purse. And more than that, although there may be a difference in the application of the principle, both parties are agreed in wishing to see our Navy adequate for national defence. The Noble Marquess mentioned as a recommendation of the present scheme that it proposes to spend double the amount spent in the time of Lord Beaconsfield. I quite admit that it is so, but I cannot say that is any great recommendation. On the question of expenditure, if not for the best of all possible objects, I think it is desirable not entirely to discard the opinions which have been laid down not only by Liberal leaders, but also by such statesmen as Sir Robert Peel and Lord Beaconsfield. Sir Robert Peel particularly repudiated the advantage to the country of greatly increasing its naval and military operations in order that it might reign supreme, because, he said, the result of that would be that other countries would follow that example, and the result would be that each country would spend enormous resources merely in the fear of military operations. Lord Beaconsfield, on one occasion, almost prayed the House of Commons in the interest of peace to diminish rather than to increase expenditure of this kind. Now, Nemo Marquess has stated... What will be the result of this scheme? He says that in 1894, the Navy will be equal to the navies of any two, of, two combined countries. This statement would have been more reassuring if a similar statement had not been made some time before. The government, when they came into office, I think, for two years in succession, made a reduction in the expenditure on the Navy. The Noble Marquess shakes his head. Marcus of Salisbury, not a reduction in naval construction. Earl Granville, the reduction was in the Navy estimates. The Marcus of Salisbury, Yes, but not in the Naval Construction Department. Earl Granville, I hardly see how a reduction in the estimates can be inconsistent with a reduction in construction. And the government stated at the time that our Navy was equal to the navies of any other two countries in the world. Naval Marquess now prophesies exactly the same thing for 1894. But the fact of that statement having been made at the time diminishes the confidence to be placed in assurances of this character. The government also stated at the time, in the most positive way, that it was very unwise to lay down many ships at once, for the somewhat obvious reason that in 10 or 15 years they would become obsolete. I'm not very much reassured on this point by the declarations of the Noble Marquess, because one of the reasons which he gave for the great constitutional innovation without precedent as to mode of paying this expenditure was that the Admiralty was apt to change the design of their ships and to omit what they thought were improvements. It appears to me that there is no such great danger as that which has been stated. My lords, the noble Marquess has thought it right at this stage of the bill, a bill which is certain to pass, to raise an alarm. He made certain statements which I defy anyone to say were not of the most alarming character. It is quite true that in the last sentence or two of his speech the noble Marquess made uh, rather answered himself. But it is impossible to place faith in the picture of the danger which he says in very short time, we may be liable to. I am not over sanguine uh, when I say that this is, picture is overdrawn. I am quite sure that we ought to do all that is necessary to make the Navy adequate. But to base upon fears, which I believe are very largely exaggerated, if not chimeral, is not wise nor prudent. The noble Marquess has made very little defence for the perfectly new and unprecedented course of meeting the naval expenditure adopted by the government, and of taking it away from the control of Parliament. It does not, however, really take the matter away from the control of Parliament, because there is still the possibility of another government coming into power, and if they were to have a large majority at their back, their back the House of Commons might, of course, repeal and alter the bill now before us. In that case, it is worthwhile your Lordship's considering whether this House will not be placed in a false position. I do not wish to go into details, and I have no intention to vote against the second reading of the bill. A great debate between statespersons.
This, of course, all comes from the wonderful Hansard site. And I've got a link up here and the links down below in the description. I cannot overestimate and over explain how important this website is to the work of historians like me and like Track and like Jamie. Because these are the debates and we can go and search them. And I mean mine them for information. Debate in 1899 and 18, 1889 is special. There is a further debate in 1894. There is another debate in 1898. And they are all worth reading because there are people with a clear vision of not only Britain's foreign policy, but also how that should be ascribed to the fence. It's one of the amazing things. We've got these huge defence reviews now taking part every few years in the UK. It's pretty much baked into our system almost constitutionally. And the debates, they are about the procurement of this weapon system or that weapon system this technical capability or that technical capability. They don't go into the strategy anymore. Sometimes they sound like they're reading from various manufacturers' sales pitches. There was a clear reason for why they had to make decision they had they did in eighteen eighty nine Salisbury went through it, and it was a choice not of which is the best option but which is the least worst option, which option starts building up the capacity in the navy, but if we know if we do if we build up the capacity in the navy, then the other nations are going to respond. Salisbury is far too intelligent a person, far too experienced a politician, far too inexperienced a leader of Britain to believe that Britain building up ships would not be answered by the other nations and not have a response. The question he was going on was whether it would take the French still seven years to build a ship. No. Uh, the question he was focusing on was the idea of whether it was early enough to start the build-up. Because there were tensions, and you couldn't put off growing your armed forces any longer, modernising your armed forces, increasing the pace of modernization, which is what this is really about. And most importantly, he's growing cruisers. He's growing the commerce protection and commerce interdiction capability of the Royal Navy. It's almost like he's read every Napoleonic war history where every admiral is sitting there crying out for more frigates because they are always in demand you need them to watch the enemy you need them to scout you need them to go and find uh, to stop enemy surface raiders to be your surface raiders you need them everywhere doing everything And that's what he's doing. He's ordering cruisers. So, join me in part three for those ships and a look at those ships that were built. Take care. Thank you for joining me. Oh, 
And thank you to everyone who likes. Thank you to everyone who subscribes. Thank you to everyone who's watched. Thank you to everyone who's joined Discord. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. And thank you to everyone who does super chats. You're all amazing. Thank you. And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.